When you think of nuclear disasters, the first thing that probably comes to mind is Chernobyl. However, this was not the first nuclear disaster, nor was it the last. It seems that several nuclear tragedies have either been overlooked or intentionally left out of history books for various reasons. Nuclear power can be a great source of energy, but it can also lead to catastrophe. You're about to find out about the most deadly nuclear accidents of all time, and the crazy part is you probably haven't heard of most of them. Many consider an accident at Chalk River Laboratories in the 1950s to be one of the first nuclear accidents that ever occurred. Chalk River Laboratories is located just over 100 miles northwest of Ottawa, Canada. In the 1950s, it was a state-of-the-art facility where scientists, engineers, and researchers worked on developing future nuclear technology. But with the new technology comes a risk, and when dealing with nuclear energy, these risks can be huge. On December 12, 1952, the National Research Experimental Reactor at Chalk River encountered a power flow issue that resulted in a runaway fission reaction. The temperature in the coolant tank began to rise slowly at first, but as researchers tried to get it under control, things went from bad to worse. Sirens started to blare as the temperatures in the reactor core rose to dangerous levels. The engineers tried to lower the control rods into the coolant tank, but they jammed and the chain reactions continued. Suddenly, three of the rods began to lift out of the coolant tank unexpectedly. The engineers panicked as the rods continued to rise and overheat. In the next instant, the core went into meltdown. Hydrogen explosions rocked the building. The reactor seal blew off its hinges and dumped 1.2 million gallons of radioactive waste into the basement of the Chalk River facility. The scientists and researchers knew that the radioactive water was dangerous, but proper waste disposal procedures had not yet been put in place. Engineers at Chalk River dug ditches only 5,000 feet away from the Ottawa River where they dumped the water from the reactor. Unsurprisingly, some of the radioactive waste leached into the Ottawa River system and the surrounding area. The radiation spread throughout the region and flowed toward the United States. Interestingly, future President Jimmy Carter was stationed as a naval officer in Schenectady, New York at the time, where he and 26 other men helped clean up the Chalk River nuclear accident. It's unknown how many people were affected by the disaster, but the insane part is that the facility reopened two years later with very few modifications made to the procedures and mechanisms. Therefore, it wasn't surprising that in 1958, Chalk River Laboratory suffered another nuclear accident. The National Research Universal Reactor was housed in a separate building than the first reactor, but a similar set of circumstances led to problems with this reactor as well. The fuel rods began to overheat just like at the National Research Experimental Reactor from years before. The scientists realized they were headed toward a second meltdown and used a robotic crane to lift one of the metallic uranium rods out of the reactor. However, as the crane moved the rod away from the reactor, the uranium caught fire and fell into the core below. The entire facility was doused with radiation and the surrounding area became contaminated once again. Even worse, the valves for the facility's ventilation system were left wide open, resulting in large amounts of radioactive steam being released into the air. The researchers and engineers scrambled to extinguish the fire before the rest of the reactor rods went into meltdown. They dumped buckets of wet sand into the hole in the reactor's containment vessel, and the fire was eventually put out. But large amounts of radiation had already leaked from the reactor core. Military personnel had to be brought in to aid with the cleanup of all the radioactive waste. It's hard to tell just how many people suffered due to the radiation leaks at Chalk River Laboratories in the 50s. The people who worked there and those who helped with the cleanup were both exposed to unhealthy levels of radiation. No reports indicate that anyone immediately died from radiation exposure, but as time went on, medical issues began to arise, such as higher rates of cancer and other illnesses connected to radiation poisoning in the people who worked at or lived near the Chalk River Nuclear Research Facility. We may never know the extent to which the Chalk River Laboratory accidents affected people in the environment. We'll also probably never know if the radiation leaked into the nearby river systems and ended up affecting people living downstream. Either way, these last two nuclear accidents were some of the first to occur, but most certainly would not be the last. Between those two nuclear accidents at Chalk River in the 50s, a much worse disaster occurred in the Soviet Union in 1957. After World War II, the Soviet Union began constructing nuclear facilities like crazy. They needed to outdo the Americans, or at least keep up with them if they were going to remain a dominant power in the world. Nuclear facilities at the time were used to conduct research and develop weapons. The Mayak nuclear fuel processing plant was located in the town of Osiorsk in southwestern Russia. On September 29th, the cooling system at the facility failed. The core began to overheat as workers tried to get the chain reaction under control. Unfortunately, they failed. The reactor exploded, sending a massive cloud of radioactive particles into the air. Unlike the Chalk River disaster that was somewhat contained, these particles swept across the Russian landscape. 
contaminating entire towns as wind currents carried them across the country. The deadly particles spread over 300 square miles. The Soviet government waited an entire week before declaring a state of emergency and evacuating the 10,000 residents who had been in the path of the radioactive cloud. But at that point, it was too late. The Mayak facility was highly classified, and the Soviet government did not want word to spread of its existence. The evacuated citizens were given no clear reason as to why they were being moved or that they should be concerned about radiation. The Soviet people were eventually resettled. But as time went on, the population started to develop some mysterious ailments. People's skin began to redden and die. Entire portions of their skin and muscles fell off the bone as a result of high radiation exposure. It was now clear what had happened in the region and what the Soviet government was trying to hide. In order to cover their tracks, Soviet leaders created the East Ural Nature Reserve, which encompassed the entire contaminated area. This was done solely to prohibit access to the region. It wasn't until two decades later that a Russian biologist named Zores Medvedev blew the whistle on his own government and exposed what happened at the Mayak facility. It's estimated that 200 people died from cancer as a direct result of radiation exposure from the Mayak nuclear accident. However, it's highly likely that thousands more were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation and suffered from illnesses caused by the nuclear accident. The incident has come to be known as the Kishtim disaster, because until recently, Ozyorsk didn't appear on any official maps. The Soviet government did their best to suppress any information about the facility or the disaster that occurred there. This is why the nuclear accident was named after Kishtim, the next closest town that appeared on maps. The same year as the Kishtim disaster in the Soviet Union, Great Britain had their own nuclear mishap. On October 10, 1957, Britain's first nuclear reactor, known as Windscale, was working to create more material for their nuclear weapons program. The facility had been running since the 40s without any problems, but on this day, things went terribly wrong. Workers at the facility were running routine maintenance on the reactor when they noticed temperatures began to rise. The temperatures were still within reasonable levels, but they didn't seem to be leveling off. The workers tried circulating fresh coolant to keep the temperatures down, yet nothing seemed to work. It quickly became apparent that something was very wrong. One of the scientists realized that the uranium-filled graphite core within the reactor had caught fire. But this wasn't a new development. The fire had been burning within the core for at least two days prior, since the moment the core had caught fire had been releasing radioactive contaminants into the air. At this point, there was nothing that could be done about the radiation already spewed into the atmosphere. The engineers at Windscale needed to keep the core from completely melting down to stop any further contamination. They brought in cooling fans, compressed carbon dioxide, and cold water to drop the core's temperature. After days of work, the staff at Windscale smothered the fire and brought the core's temperature back to safe levels. It was now October 12th, and a radioactive cloud was drifting across the UK and into Europe. There was no way to evacuate the enormous area that was being covered by radioactive particles. One set of precautions taken at the time was to pull all the milk and dairy products from the shelves of stores for a month. Even still, it's estimated that the windscale disaster caused around 250 cases of cancer. This is probably a lowball assessment. Upon inspection of the windscale disaster, it was found that the accidents could have been avoided. The fire that began in the core should never have happened, and the fact that it was allowed to burn for several days put the lives of countless people at risk. Like with the Kishtim incident in the Soviet Union, windscale was hidden from the public for several decades. This was likely because Britain didn't want its own nuclear weapons program hindered by restrictions and red tape. At the time, nuclear war seemed almost inevitable to many, and the importance of developing nuclear weapons far outweighed the risks. Not all nuclear accidents occurred on land, however. Deep in the North Atlantic, a nuclear-powered submarine almost sunk as a result of a deadly accident. K-19 was a hotel-class Soviet submarine. This was the classification that NATO intelligence gave nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. On July 4, 1961, K-19 was traveling in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic when its nuclear engine began to overheat. There was a malfunction in the coolant system and there was no backup, so the sub's crew did the only thing they could figured out a way to fix the coolant leak. The reactor started to become alarmingly hot, and if the crew didn't find a way to redirect coolant to the nuclear core, it would explode and release an enormous amount of radiation throughout the submarine and into the ocean. Brave engineers and other crew members locked themselves in the engine room and worked on fixing the reactor as radiation ripped through their bodies. These men knew they would receive a lethal dose of radiation, but it didn't matter. They would do whatever it took to save their crewmates. Eventually, they were able to jerry-rig the coolant system to divert the necessary cold water to the core and bring the temperature down. The submarine couldn't travel back to the Soviet Union on its own, but at least the core wouldn't explode and destroy the sub. A rescue mission was launched to bring K-19 back to port. Another sub towed K-19 across the Atlantic and returned it to the shores of the Soviet Union. When the crew disembarked K-19, the men working on fixing the core were found to have been bombarded by radiation. 
In the coming months, many would become seriously ill and die as a result of their heroic actions. Other members of the K-19 who were not exposed to as much radiation survived for many more years. However, all the men aboard K-19 would eventually succumb to diseases associated with radiation exposure. But this is not where this particular disaster ends. Although the submarine did not explode and the crew members were able to live for a few years after the accident, other tragedies occurred as a result of the K-19 accident. The sub that towed K-19 back to base also became contaminated by the radiation. Many of the men aboard the rescue sub also became ill due to radiation. Even after K-19 was docked to be repaired, the nuclear core continued to release radiation. The people on the naval base and the workers who fixed the sub all became contaminated. Although we'll never know how many people died as a direct result of the radiation leak aboard K-19, it would seem anyone who came into contact with the sub received enough radiation to alter their health. It's possible that dozens or even hundreds of people were affected by the nuclear accident aboard K-19. In 1979, the United States would experience its own nuclear disaster. This would be one of the worst accidents at a nuclear power plant in the world. Up until this point, most nuclear accidents were a result of nuclear material being created for weapons or to power vessels of war. However, the accident at Three Mile Island would cause controversy around nuclear energy and the dangers that come with it. To this day, the events at Three Mile Island have eroded the public's confidence in nuclear energy. On March 28, 1979, a pressure valve at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania failed to close. The nuclear plant was supposed to be state-of-the-art and promised to bring the United States an efficient, affordable energy source. When the pressure valve in one of the reactors failed, it caused cooling water contaminated with radiation to flow through different parts of the facility. The workers in the control room realized what was happening and desperately tried to redirect the contaminated water. But in the chaos, the workers made a series of errors that made matters worse. The irradiated water continued to spread. They diverted water all night, but by the following morning, the core had reached over 4,000 degrees. If the temperature increased to 5,000 degrees, it would melt down, leading to a catastrophic explosion that would send radioactive debris across the country. The power plant was spewing radioactive steam into the air, but things could get much worse. The owners of the power plant downplayed the critical nature of the situation. First, they claimed the meltdown was under control when it was not, and then they said no radiation was leaking out of the power plant. However, within days, radiation was detected in four different counties around Three Mile Island. The governor of Pennsylvania immediately issued an order for pregnant women and small children to be evacuated from the area since they would be the most vulnerable to radiation. As this was happening, the cooling system of the nuclear power plant was still not working properly. People fled their homes and headed to safety. On March 31st, the emergency teams finally got the valves back online and were able to cool the core before it exploded. No direct deaths or injuries were recorded during this time at Three Mile Island, but the fact that radioactive particles were released into the atmosphere and dispersed across the state cannot be overlooked. Some studies suggest that there might be a correlation between increased cancer and infant mortality rates in the region and the release of radiation from the nuclear power plant. If this is true, then the Three Mile Island incident not only caused the American people to become wary of nuclear energy, but also might have led to the early deaths of many citizens, making it the deadliest nuclear accident on American soil. Faulty parts caused some nuclear accidents, others were caused by carelessness. This was the case with a nuclear contamination event in Goiânia, Brazil in 1987. A radiotherapy institution within the city decided to relocate and leave some of their old equipment behind. However, they did not follow the proper waste disposal protocols when disposing of the equipment, especially those containing radioactive material. On September 13, two scavengers entered the abandoned building and removed one of the teletherapy units that still contained highly radioactive cesium chloride. The two men carried the radioactive unit to a junkyard in a wheelbarrow where they sold it to the junkyard owner. The problem was that the teletherapy device was spewing radiation the entire trip from the abandoned building to the junkyard. When the junkyard owner saw that this newly acquired device contained glowing blue material, he invited his friends and family over to see it. The scavengers, the junkyard owner, and everyone who came into contact with the device had no idea they were being exposed to high amounts of radiation. After the incident, hundreds of people began to show signs of radiation sickness. This nuclear accident wasn't due to a core meltdown or weapons, but leftover medical equipment. It's estimated that 245 people were exposed to radiation. This led to high rates of cancer in Goiânia at the time, something that could have been prevented just by eliminating the negligence around the disposing of radioactive materials. And this brings us to the worst nuclear disaster that's ever occurred. It was at 1 a.m. on April 25, 1986, and the Chernobyl nuclear power plant operators began reducing power on reactor number 4 for routine maintenance and a safety test. 
The safety test was being conducted to identify if the still spinning turbines could create enough power to keep the coolant pumps running if the plant was to lose power. At 2 p.m. on April 25th, Reactor No. 4's cooling system was shut down so that it didn't interfere with the test. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. There was a change in personnel around 11 p.m. when the night shift took over the test. They were less experienced and never received proper instructions on how to carry out the test safely. On April 26, 1.23 a.m., the test officially began. As soon as it started, a sudden power surge occurred. An operator pressed the emergency shutdown button, but the control rods jammed as they entered the core and exploded. The blast caused the 1,000-ton roof to be blown off the nuclear power plant. A fireball erupted into the sky, radiation spewed out of the core, and irradiated particles filled the sky. Fires broke out across the Chernobyl power station as workers tried desperately to get the reactor to stabilize. In order to get control of the situation, the Soviet government blockaded the nearby town without informing the police or anyone involved of the potential risks of radiation poisoning. By 6.35 a.m., all fires were extinguished and the rest of the reactors were shut down, but radiation continued to pour out of Reactor 4. The firefighters and workers believed the radiation was under control, but they were misinformed. When it became clear that the nuclear reactor was still expelling massive amounts of radiation, the government ordered the evacuation of the surrounding areas. On April 28, Swedish air monitors detected large amounts of radiation coming from the Soviet Union. The USSR informs the world that there had been a nuclear accident at Chernobyl. Over the next several days, 800,000 workers were brought in to help with the cleanup. They pumped liquid nitrogen underneath the power plant to try to cool the core. Mounds of sand were dumped into the reactor from helicopters. It wasn't until May 6 that the radioactive emissions began to decline as the fire in the core burned itself out. The emergency workers began constructing a concrete structure around the core to contain the radioactive fallout. Official records claim that only 31 people died as a result of the Chernobyl accident, but the number is likely much higher due to the number of workers involved and the amount of radiation they were exposed to. Many people likely died years later from cancers caused by the radiation from the Chernobyl explosion, while countless acres of land became uninhabitable due to radioactivity. As technology advanced and we created safer reactors, nuclear accidents have decreased. There are around 440 nuclear reactors in the world today. The last one to melt down was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Okuma, Fukushima, Japan. This disaster was the result of a tsunami and earthquake that decimated the northeastern part of the country. The meltdown resulted in the deaths of two workers but leaked radioactive waste into water supplies and the surrounding area. Now watch What If North Korea Launched a Nuclear Bomb, Minute by Minute, or check out What Happens to Nuclear Waste.